basically H3N2 in 2012, what happened? We'll talk about that just a little bit, this unique uh, animal and human event that took place in our state and other states. Uh, we had a rapid response. We took the One Health approach to it, including not only our veterinary community, but our public health community. And then, of course, what's next on some of the steps as we take a look into, into 2013. Uh, we have known for some time that there are swine influenza viruses. And we also have known for some time that if you take pigs to exhibitions, that those viruses may travel with them to those exhibitions. So this is not particularly new. Uh, we've had this going on for a very long time. But the uniqueness of what we had this last summer, a phone call that I received, as I mentioned, on the 12th of July of last year from a veterinarian in one of our counties, kind of changed the, uh, the approach that we've taken to these tasks in the past. And I, I, again, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you a little bit about it. We happened to have the national record last year with 138 human cases of H3N2. Uh, there were residents of 24 different counties. They were associated with 14 different fairs in our state, and the last case was on August of last year. So again, we started in July the 12th with the first phone call, and by August it was gone. Uh, it just left as quickly as it came to our state. Nationally, there were 306 cases associated with fairs. 98% of those individuals are under the 19 years of age. So this was kind of the, the situation that we had unfolding in Indiana. As I mentioned on our timeline, I first received a phone call from LaPorte County, Delaware, on July the 12th. Uh, I happened to have a Board of Animal Health meeting that day, and it, it ran late into the afternoon, and they said, we've got one more thing before you leave. And indeed, we took a phone call from the practitioner. Now, what was unique about this phone call from the practitioner is that uh, Dr. Smith has worked that county for about 30 years. So he knows about county fairs, he knows about sick pigs and all this sort of thing, but he said there's something different. And of course, all of us are kind of in the business for those unusual events. And of course, I've told the story about being a senior in veterinary college and going down to the large animal clinics, and if you get a case that day, you were on a clipboard. So sure enough, I went down that day and it was Marsh, and the consigner's name, or the uh, client's name, and they brought in a Holstein cow, and in the far right-hand column of that clipboard were the letters ADR. <laughs> and of course, I didn't know at the time what that meant, and later learned that that meant that she ain't doing right. <laughs> and so that's kind of what we're all in the business of. We're looking for what ain't doing right, and that's why Dr. Smith called. He's seen influenza before, but it presented differently. He was used to nasal discharge and coughing and barking pigs and febrile pigs. But in this event, he knew something was going on. They were simply off feed and hot. The barn was otherwise quiet. But the exhibitors were coming to say, something's wrong with my pig, it won't eat. And of course, that's all part of that ongoing surveillance at any exhibition or any other <coughs> event where the producer or exhibitor says, something's not right. So they called the practitioner and he tempted some of the pigs in the barn and they were hot, 106, 107. But the real reason he called was because again, he dealt with febrile pigs before, was that the next morning was the annual 4-H sale. And he remembered that if a pig is 106 degrees or hotter on anamortem inspection, it's condemned. So he wanted to make sure if they offered pigs at the, at the county fair sale to merchants in the local area that the pig would pass if it ended up in, at the plant. So that's how this whole thing started. So we agreed that, of course, it's July, and it's Indiana July, and it's drought in Indiana July, and it's about 105 degrees. It's plenty hot. So we said, well, you've got a lot of ambient things going on, in addition to the fact that the pigs may have a febrile event going on otherwise. So we decided to wait until overnight, let the buildings and everything cool down, and they would temp all the pigs the following morning. And sure enough, they had 30-some percent of these pigs didn't pass the next morning because they were over 105 degrees and they wouldn't offer them in the sale. So that's kind of how things got started, even to the point that uh, the young kids said uh, they were, had a pig to present for sale, didn't bring the pig into the ring, they just brought a picture of their pig to the <laughs> ring and this sort of thing. So we had that kind of thing going on in LaPorte County. Now, by the next morning, on the 13th, we had a phone call from a reporter in South Bend, Indiana, and she was en route to the Laporte County Fair. And she called our office and wanted to know what we knew about the people being sick at the fair. 
Well, we didn't know anything about the people being sick at the fair. We'd had the call from Dr. Smith the evening before, and she said, yes, I'm over there, going over there to interview the parents of children who are sick, and they believe they become sick because the pigs are sick. Now, this was the first time we didn't get that call from anyone else. Uh, it came from a reporter, and she was en route, and indeed she went there, and the press had a, had a, a, a lot of things to talk about. Uh, the parents were happy to explain how their child was sick, and so it, it unfortunately, as you might expect, it generated a lot of... Uh, a lot of energy locally up there. But indeed, we had sick kids at the same time. Some of these kids that had a pig that was to, for sale weren't even well enough to hold the picture up in the ring. They were home in bed. So suddenly we had both things going on. And by the time we decided to take some samples on the pigs and public health became involved in the local community and the local public health department was actually very helpful. Uh, they followed up on some of these individuals, uh, swapped some of these children, CDC was involved, our state health department, local health department, our veterinarians on our team at the Board of Animal Health, the local practitioners, so everybody was in this game together. Not knowing that, by the 19th, Hendricks County would call, Monroe County would call, Washington County would call, and these are in various parts of the state. So they're not contiguous counties to report. So we knew something was going on different this year than all the years that we've had fairs going on. Sick pigs in all these counties, and of course the reality is everyone's calling in and says, what should I do now? And by the time we got to Washington County and Monroe County, when they would call my office and said, let me guess, you've been at the fair six days. <laughs> and they said, how did you know? And I said, well, it's like everybody else. Uh, you've been there long enough. By the time they've been there, incubated, shed that virus around, everything was cooked up pretty well by the sixth day, and you could just about bet that's when they were calling. Different counties took different approaches. Some counties sent all the pigs home. Some counties, in the case of Washington County, you can see it's August the 3rd, school had started. So if they sent all the pigs home, the kids were in school, there wasn't anybody there to take care of the pig during the day, so they locked down the building. So just leave them here. So indeed they did. They left the tack boxes, uh, the lawn chairs, the umbrellas, everything, and the pigs included, and left them that far and locked it down. And everyone pitched in to take care of those pigs until they recovered so they could be sent off to, uh, to market. The challenge in the meantime, of course, is the buyer of those pigs out of that particular county said, well, I'm not sure we want those anymore. So they lost their pig market in the meantime and had to go out and find another buyer because of all the energy that had gone on with this particular event. Now, we have pigs to get influenza and recover and go to slaughter routinely. But because of all the extra emphasis with this particular event, they, it took them quite a little while to find a home for those pigs. But the reality is we have this event going on. In Monroe County, for example, of those 136 cases we had in the state, 70 of them came from that, into that county. So public health got very involved in this process. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of energy and a lot of activity, but a very short timeline because, as I mentioned, even though samples were coming in from people from around the state by the 16th of August, that was the last case, and it was over. We haven't had another one since. So it was there, moved through quickly, and left. So then the question is, okay, so we've gone through this event, and, of course, I should mention that we also had a state fair coming up pretty shortly. On the 3rd of August, you saw that last timeline. We were to start checking pigs in on the 2nd at the Indiana State Fair. So do you even have a show? Should we have a show at the State Fair? We knew we had kids that were getting sick. We knew we had pigs that were sick. Uh, we convened a number of teleconferences with our veterinarians around the state and others and say, well, maybe we should take a different approach altogether. And, of course, as you might imagine, if you're going to cancel the 4-H show at the Indiana State Fair, that's going to generate a whole lot more attention than what we already had. So we decided to go ahead and didn't have much time to decide what measures we might put in place. And you've likely heard by now we decided to take the temperatures on each of the pigs that were brought to the fair for the 4-H part of the project. As I recall, it was exactly 1,983 pigs uh, that they took the temperatures on out there at the fair with the notion that it was a, if they were hotter than 105 degrees, they wouldn't be entered. Now, as Dr. Coleman mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion about this since. I don't know whether 105 is right or wrong yet, but that's what we chose. Uh, a high normal might be 104 or so, so, and it's about 105 out, 
side as the ambient timber, so we gave him 105. As we move through that process then, again, that was about the only tool we had because we had just about 24 hours to decide whether we were even going to have a show or not. And I'll have to say that those digital thermometers you can buy down at the grocery store or the drugstore work out pretty well. And then if they were too hot on that digital thermometer, then we'd use a glass thermometer. And sure enough, we did have a pig show up that was 106 or so. And said, well, we had said we would send them home. And of course, they'd only traveled about two and a half hours to get to the fairgrounds and what have you. And I said, well, pull out of the line. We'll figure out what we're going to do. Because we recognized also we may have some transport heat. These pigs have traveled a good bit of distance. And so, indeed, if we gave them 20 minutes or so to cool down, out of those 1,983, we didn't send any home. But we also recognized there was going to be more to be done once they got into the building. So we had ongoing surveillance once they were in the building. We worked with contract veterinarians on the fairgrounds as well as our Board of Animal Health staff and continued to do monitoring and surveillance throughout the run of the fair. It was, again, we started this in a, a, a Monday night and into Tuesday, and by Saturday we started getting some pigs beginning to show up on that same timeline. And so by Monday morning, we had a few pigs that were being carried over for an open barrel show, and the state fair decided to suspend that show, uh, empty the building, and clean and disinfect and start again. We're not aware of uh, uh, human illness associated with it, but we also recognize that at some of these county fairs, they were associated with their exposure to pigs at the agricultural fair. Uh, we even had pig people who did not own pigs, but went through the building. So we knew that that exposure exists. And of course, we've all been to these fairs. You've got strollers, sippy cups, you've got kids being walked through, and of course the kids that big are right nose to nose with the pig, right? So you're right down in that environment. And those were some of the considerations as we look to the 2013 year. What should you do? What are appropriate measures to make sure we can still hopefully have a fair, but at the same time put some measures in place that we could all consider? So Indiana, we sat down as a state and said, so what would we do? We came up with four recommendations. Uh, we sent those out to the counties through extension. We have 92 counties in our state, and uh, counties began to work on this. We said, basically, do what you can, uh, but more is better. Let's reduce the risk when we can. Uh, we didn't make it a mandate. It wasn't a rule. We just put these out and said, these are some of the measures we came up with. We're blessed at Indiana with some great swine veterinarians. And we tapped their expertise, and uh, did, by teleconference and otherwise said, so what should we do? One of these was that we proposed that they vaccinate, the notion that we would uh, they'd less likely become infected and less shedding. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about uh, the working group that came together. They were less enamored with vaccination than our state protocol was, but nonetheless, that was the one we came up with. Given prior to opening day of the fair, following the label instructions, we talked about the two-dose regimen. There is a single-dose product out there, withdrawal times, 21 days, etc. trying to piece all these things together. The nice thing that we have, and of course we're getting, I think May 15th in Indiana, you have to have your pig if you're going to have a project, and so we're rapidly approaching that point. We've had a number of these pig sales, and many of those folks have already put an 840 tag in the pig's ear and given them the first dose. So they've, at the sale level, they've tried to get these pigs ready to go. So the first one was <coughs> vaccination. Second one was shorten the, the stay on the site. If we could reduce the length of time that those pigs were on the site, we felt like that could help us a great deal. The picture there you can't see real well, but that's an empty barn at our Indiana State Fair. Uh, congregation uh, increases the opportunity for disease spread, ideally less than 72 hours. And we have really had some counties who worked hard on this. As a matter of fact, I had some calls from some families that show beef cattle, and they said, would you please change ours to 72 hours? <laughs> uh, we'd like to have a little shorter, too. On the other hand, we've had swine people say, I think we're kind of being picked on. We'd like to be there all week, too. Uh, so we've had responses both ways. But limiting the time as much as possible, uh, could you reduce it at least a day or two? We've had some of these that are up to eight days. By the time they come in and bring in all the camping equipment and the meals and all this sort of thing and move to the fairgrounds for about a week, uh, that's what we had out there. Load out the swine. The other thing was if you're done with your competition, go home. And I can remember back in uh, well, several years ago when I used to check in all these homes at various county fairs, in order to complete the project under 4-H, you had to be on the ground so long and all these sorts of things. And fortunately, 4-H was very helpful. The extension said, if you're done with your show, go home. 
and that helped us also. So we've implemented a number of these procedures at state fairs moving this direction as well. Most will have the bulk of the hogs gone. <clears throat> You'll have some carryover hogs waiting for that annual county fair sale. So we've reduced the population, but they won't necessarily all be gone. But I think the counties have done a good job working that direction. And then monitoring swine. Once they get on the grounds, what do you do with them once they're there? Uh, establishing a relationship with a local veterinarian. Uh, we, we again offer this notion of a rectal <coughs> temperature here, uh, up to 105 degrees, uh, particularly on these glass thermometers. We had a pig at the state fair, for example, and of course it's late and it's dark and all this stuff. And we have summer veterinary interns that we hire from the college at Purdue. And so we had a digital thermometer reading that was too hot, and so they had the glass thermometer. And it was handed out through the rails of the trailer to one of our veterinary interns, and he was trying to turn it and whatever. He said, well, I can't read it. So I had to get my glasses out, so they handed it to me, and I started turning it. And sure enough, that pig was a hot. It filled the chamber. 108. Well, it turns out that the gate got down between two of these bears, and I think they fought all the way from Fort Wayne all the way to Indianapolis. So they were good and hot by the time they got there. But the kind of things you run into, but continue to do this monitoring once they're on the ground, I uh, encourage them to take these temperatures and remove the pigs. Again, we use temperature as the best metric that we had, and we've encouraged even some of the counties are going to do this preemptory temping of pigs. Uh, we'll be doing that again this year at the State Fair. I'll, I'll offer one thing that we didn't expect, and I think I shared this with the group uh, prior. One of the things, as I mentioned, it's hot. It's August in Indiana. It's hot everywhere through the Midwest. Uh, but one of the things that we didn't expect that was kind of a tangential benefit was animal welfare. Uh, people knew in advance that we were going to take these temperatures. Uh, fortunately, if you register to show an exhibit at the State Fair, you have to offer an email address. So the evening before, they sent a blast email to every exhibitor that said, be prepared, we're going to take the temperature on your pig tomorrow or the next day whenever you arrive. These pigs arrived on ice. <laughs> they had fans. Uh, they had, I mean, it was pretty comfortable travel. Uh, these pigs were in pretty good shape. Uh, not that they aren't always well cared for, but they were especially well cared for in preparation for the 2012 State Fair. So a little tangential bit of it. The fourth thing that we had, those were the three things, vaccination, uh, monitoring of the animals, and, uh, well, what was the third one I had up there? shortened the stay. The fourth one we had was ID. Uh, totally unrelated to this whole event, we had already had an agreement with the State Fair that we would put 840 tags on all the pigs at the exhibition. So we've had this at Hoosier Beef Congress for about three years. We talked to the State Fair and they said they've been putting a tag in all these pigs at a weigh-in at the State Fair and said why don't we just swap one tag for another and put an 840 in. And we have premises registration as a requirement in our state the state fair picked up on that, so all these pigs received an 840. They're integrating that into the making up the show classes and all this sort of thing as a part of the process, and it has worked extremely well. So we're doing that again this year at our Indiana State Fair. So from that, as Dr. Coleman mentioned, and thank you for that October meeting, I thought it worked out extremely well. The National Pork Board called the meeting in Des Moines. Uh, we had a good conversation with a number of states involved. And from there, it kind of grew this working group uh, to include not only the partners who were at the meeting in Des Moines, but a number of folks from CDC, the public health community, uh, the International Association of Fairs and Expositions, the National Swine Registry, American Association of Swine Veterinarians. So there's quite a broad group of folks to come in. I have heard from some of these folks since this working group met that they had not been in the same room with some of these folks. So that we had people in animal health that had never been in the same room with some of these folks from public health and vice versa. So it was a good opportunity. Uh, we had uh, a, a really good group of folks. Uh, we met in Indianapolis, as it turned out. We had an 18-person panel that worked to put this together with the notion that, okay, so Indiana had some experience, Ohio and other states had an experience, but what would we do in the national interest? We convened in January. We had broad participation, as I mentioned. Uh, whether it's industry, state and federal, 4-H, academia. Uh, we just had a, a really good group of folks, many I, who, of whom I've not met before, but I really appreciated their participation to say, so what do we do in the national interest? And, of course, we recognize in Indiana, 
I had mentioned a number of times, what we put on the street was not for everyone, we recognize. We wrote it for us, but if there were some pieces or parts of that that could be used in the national interest, we were certainly happy to share. These were measures. You know, it's interesting how a word can make a difference. Right, Dr. Tillman? We <laughs> talked about recommendations. We talked about lots of things. So we ended up with measures. So these are measures to minimize. Uh, developed based on the current evidence and collected knowledge of the group. And I tell you what, I was, I was lucky to be in the room with all the credentials these folks had. Uh, we had some pretty high-powered folks in this room, not intended to supersede whatever regulations exist in, exist in local, state, or federal laws. Flexible to meet the particular needs. You can implement in full or parts of it, whatever works for you. And we took the approach that said, what are the measures you would take before, during, and after an event? And so we broke them up into those particular components, and I think it worked well. This particular document, and I think I've got a copy of it here. I just, I just brought one because it's available online. The title is Measures to Minimize Influence of Transmission at Swine's Exhibitions 2013. This was a, it was co-chaired. I have when I was fortunate to be one of the co-chairs with the National Association of, uh, uh, National Assembly of State Animal Health Officials. So we have state veterinarians involved. We also had the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians. So that was the, those were the two who co-chaired this particular event. Uh, that particular document is available on the USAHA website, for example. So before the event, you need to establish a communication network, state and local officials, DVM staff, and others. It sounds simple, but that's really kind of the core of a, of a number of these events. So how are we communicating amongst ourselves? making sure everyone's on the same page, that you know everyone before it, it happens, and if you don't know everyone, at least you have a network established to where uh, you can all work together. Determining a testing protocol. We had a, a lot of conversation about that. Should you test pigs? How many should you test? What tests should you use? All these sorts of things. So we used a flu detect test at our state fair. We didn't make a big deal out of it because, frankly, we weren't sure what we had. It's the first time it had been used in that kind of setting. They've used it in the, in the avian world for influences for some time, for type A influences. Uh, we recognized it was available, so we decided to use it at our, at our state fair. The reality is that we ended up with all these county pigs coming in that represented 722 farms. So our herd in Indianapolis had 722 origins. And when you mix all that together, when you're trying to do that flu detect test, what it's really not a herd-based test because you've got this mix of populations that all dumped together for a few days. And so the results of that may be a little mixed than what you'd see in a herd base on a commercial herd, for example. But you need to make sure that you understand what signs are consistent with flu and whether you're going to test or not. And we encourage people through this document to say, take a look at that before you start. I don't know the end before you begin. Uh, determine uh, not only the communication networks, but whether you will test or not and under what protocol. Of course, Dr. Coleman talked about the National Swine Influence of Surveillance Network, and this information could be plugged right into that. We also broke it into, those were general measures, then we broke it into measures that would be helpful to the exhibit organizers. So if I happen to be the county extension agent in Allen County, Indiana, so what should I be thinking about if I'm going to host this event this summer? We talked about limit the time of congregation, and they've been working very hard. These county fair boards have been busy trying to limit that time down to 72 hours, making sure they have an established relationship with the veterinarian. Most of these do, but the reality is we've got some county fairs. Clark County, Indiana might have six pigs as the swine project at the Clark County Fair. So it's not like a lot of veterinarians are going to be running out there all day long at the Clark County Fair, but at least having that right relationship established. Establish a protocol to remove the sick pig. At what point, if you use the temperature metric, what are you going to do with that pig? You know, it's one thing if you're in the county, and it might be that you're a few miles away as opposed to the state fair and you're three hours away. But what are you going to do with that pig? Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not a person who's big about quarantines at a, at a county fairgrounds or a state fair or something. Uh, my view has been that it's a responsibility exhibitor and it doesn't pass, so it needs to go somewhere else off the grounds. Other states have utilized quarantine facilities, etc., but at least knowing in advance, what are you going to do with one that doesn't pass, doesn't make the cut? Maintaining records of IDs and sources. 
And of course, as I mentioned, whether it's at our state fair, we had email networks we could get to. We encourage the counties to do the same. Uh, most of our counties are trying to move to some sort of an electronic registration even at the county fair level so you can access that information. Let exhibitors know that something's different and they need to prepare for that as they come. So these are things exhibit organizers can be thinking about now and when we first released this uh, a couple of months ago and begin to think through that process. Now if you're an exhibitor before the exhibition, what are some things you need to be thinking about? Consulting with a veterinarian for biosecurity advice. Now that's good day in or day out, whatever event we're talking about. Being familiar with the clinical signs that you might see in influenza. Now again, the kids, the exhibitors, I should call them kids, but these exhibitors did a great job. A pig didn't eat. That's really about all we needed. Go get somebody, take a look at your pig then. It just didn't eat. I had one kid came up and he said, Harry won't eat. Not this Harry. <laughs> this yeah, it's Harry all, oh, it's obvious. That's, <laughs> if I miss a meal, you got a real problem. <laughs> but the exhibitor came up and said, Harry didn't eat this morning. And Harry always eats. That's all we needed. It's the ADR, right? She ain't doing right. Or he ain't doing right in this case. Seeking veterinary assistance if you need it. Understanding the risk to humans and animals. If you bring a sick pig to the fair, what's the consequence of your action? And think through that process, because we knew we had sick pigs and we had sick kids last year, and ask about the plans. So if you take a pig to an exhibition, I don't care whether it's Duncan, Oklahoma, or wherever it might be, if it's sick, what's the plan of the show? Remember, we asked the exhibitors to develop a plan for what you do with one that doesn't pass. The exhibitor needs to be thinking the same way. Then on the human side, what are measures people need to be thinking about? Follow CDC's recommendation for annual vaccination. And the general swine influenza vaccine that we're, we're aware of. Understanding who's at risk. And the document talks about those high-risk populations, immune-compromised individuals, etc. And it lists all those in there that they need to be aware of, that if you're in this high-risk category, you may choose to stay out of the swine park at your local exhibition. Exhibit orbit organizers, again, these are the human measures establishing these communication plans. Do you know who the county health department person is? Uh, making sure you have those networks in place. Uh, hosting non-animal activities away from the barns. We had this this year at our state fair. With all this hullabaloo going on, I get a phone call and they say, Hey, Doc, uh, we're having our annual pizza party in the show ring in the swine park. <laughs> Uh, we don't think that's a good idea. Oh, but we've done this for, you know how this goes. We've done this for, right? We've done this for 15 years. We have our pizza party in the show ring. I said, during the fair, yeah, I had missed this. <laughs> we've had dances, pizza parties, well, do that somewhere else. You need to be thinking about where else you can host the event, particularly if you're eating. You know, we've talked about don't eat in the barns and all this sort of thing. Exhibitors, if you're sick, Stay away from the pigs. Remember, it can go either way. And so if you're sick, stay home. Now, during the exhibition, here are the, some of the swine measures. We encourage the organizer to hold an exhibitor's <coughs> meeting early in the show. I know we have a number of counties that do this. Here's just kind of the, the lay of the land. Here are the rules, etc. Uh, some of the things they might talk about that and say, well, if your pig becomes sick, uh, here's a veterinarian on the grounds. He's our, he or she is our person on the grounds to take care of these events. If you have a public health event, this is the nurse's tent. Whatever those kinds of things are, it's just kind of an opportunity for everyone to be on the same page. Exhibitors observing signs for our influenza-like illness, reporting any cases. Again, consider testing, but hopefully we'll know in advance what that testing protocol is and removing those sick animals. Uh, using precautions and caring for sick animals. We had a long discussion about this. If you happen to have a sick pig at the fair, what do I need personal protective equipment? Should I be wearing masks? All those sorts of things. Some things for exhibitors and exhibit hosts to be thinking about. Also during the show, for exhibit organizers for the human measures, providing hand washing stations. I don't know how this is at your county fairs, but our state and county fairs have spent a lot of time on hand washing, particularly with the events with E. coli and some of the fairs around the country. Posting informational signage, uh, discouraging sleeping in the barns. Uh, of course, we've all seen this. It's going on for a long time, but trying to make sure we don't have unusual exposures. Notify public health officials of any illness. And public health, again, in our case, 
was quite helpful. For example, in LaPorte County, they wanted to do a survey of the families who had been at the LaPorte County Fair. Uh, we offered to them some questions about their pigs, and public health was asking about their pig, too. And so we had a good collaborative relationship in our experience there. Now, after the exhibition, of course, what are some swine measures? Clean and disinfect the swine areas, isolate and observe animals at home. Uh, sounds pretty basic, but on the other hand, it's the kind of thing we need to make sure people are aware of. Uh, and of course, we also ran into this situation where I took one of my seven pigs to this exhibition and then I brought it home. So now I've got the six at home exposed to whatever the seventh one went to it back. So you've got all those kinds of dynamics going on as well. Human measures, consult a, public, a healthcare provider if the exhibitor or family member develops influenza like illness. We had people who got sick after they got home. They were no longer at the exhibition, but if they were a part of that exhibition, to be sure that you're advising your healthcare provider that you were at a swine exhibition. So again, the document is available, it's online. Uh, in this case, uh, on the USAHA's and the National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians, uh, again, my thanks to the National Pork Corps and others who stepped up early to, to help take a look at this whole national interest, and I hope there's some information that would be helpful to you here today.